Welcome aboard, Greg McComas, and thank you very much for coming on Model Railroad Techniques today, uh, evening over in your part of the world, it's uh, mid-morning here in Australia, so thank you for taking time away from your family and your lovely layout to come and having a chat with us here. You're welcome, Daz. Thank you for having me. Really appreciate sure. it. Now, this is obviously going to be a little bit long, and I will put all the descriptions below. You're found just about everywhere on the internet, so... Predominantly, we've got a Facebook page, the Miskin Interstate St. Clair Division. If you actually type that in properly, yes, it will pop up. And it's a lovely Facebook page, videos, uh, pictures, little memes. There's all sorts going on there. You also run a, a little business that we'll talk about as well, which is macrailproducts.com. That's um, correct, yes. So, and also, you, you run a, a very comprehensive blog on your Michigan Interstate. So... That's uh, Michigan Interstate Model, or one word, rr.blogspot.com. As I said, I will put the links to all of these below, so you can just click on and go and have a look at what some of what uh, the undertakings he, he has got here. So hopefully, Greg, I've got that right. So I don't think I've normally people just got a Facebook page, but you've got all, you've hit all three points, which is great for, for the hobby. So tell us, um, I always like to get to know about people's backgrounds regarding where they've come from in the hobby because i think it's important people sort of know the progression of 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 your hobby uh hobby exploits so to speak so can you tell us some of your history please yeah absolutely um so i've been modeler since a kid uh started out i think like a lot of kids do uh christmas got myself a lgb uh you know sip on the carpet and that was kind of where i all started um uh G scale uh, into some line L for a little bit, and then a couple of years later, about I think it was about eight or nine, um, kind of jumped into HO scale with your your first figure eight, um, sure. you know, typical uh, layout. And then um, at the time, I, I grew up in Michigan. I grew up in the Detroit area, so my grandparents and my and our house we had a basement, so I was able to have a, a you know build a train layout and kind of learn from there and. Um, had two or three iterations of a, you know, a, of a teenage or a, you know a ju youth type train layout, and then uh, I moved to Texas. And in Texas space is a little bit different. There's no basements here, so yeah, um, had to have a, a, a layout in a room, like a like a side spare room we had at our house as I was growing up. And I was very fortunate, and then um, you know built a layout there. Of course, that went down college and uh, afterwards, you know, moved to our own house and, and during a career. And I've now, this is the Michigan Interstate St. Clair sub as you see it now um, and its story it's telling. This is essentially the uh, fourth iteration, if you will. So, mm -hmm. you know, I had a switching layout and then small layout. And now I've kind of really come to where it's now to double deck around the room. So uh, that's, that's where it's all kind of progressed to. So it's just been small steps, progression, you know, um, Started from real simple, and they've continued to add concepts, reinforce concepts, and and uh, nothing nothing uh, that's not obtainable to anyone that wants to be in the hobby. Yeah, sure, sure. So when I first started doing some research on the the Sinclair subdivision, as what you're building now is, um, you're a master at cramming a lot without going overboard to making it look cluttered into a, a reasonably small space. So my understanding is the room that the, the layout currently is, is 10 by 13 feet, which is a, a bedroom sort of space that you've got there. So um, tell us a little bit more about the, the St. Clair sub. So the St. Clair sub, um, you know, being the Michigan Air State is a, a freelance class two um, regional railroad. It is a proto freelance, right? So there's no actual Michigan Air State. It's all kind of based on, uh, the flavor of the area, um, and I wanted to model, try and model that in these representations. So the layout itself entails around 30 miles of the 100, 100-ish mile uh, St. Clair subdivision. It's kind of the west end of it, if you will. Um, and I had this, I said 10, 11 by 13 room. It, it luckily, it was very, very lucky. It's an office, so there's zero closets in here, so I have an open floor nice. plan. And I was able to really maximize using shelf brackets to uh, build the layout on the wall. So the room itself is actually a multi-purpose room. So there's you know, the computer on right now. This is the family computer. 
yeah, behind me is my you know my son's play area, my daughter's play area with the library. So it's a it's a versatile room that's a hobby room and also a family you know gathering place, if you will. So I'll be here working on a train. The kids will be in here, and that really allowed us to maximize the space. Let me have a train layout at the same time. Sure. Um, balance it with the family, right? It's you know by having a young family and and so using a lot of curves, right? So there's not a lot of straight track on the Michigan Air State St. Clair sub. And so I use a lot of curves and alcoves sure. and view blocks to really kind of pull you into the scene you're at. Sure. And so you don't really realize that the, the thing is not as deep as you think it is using backdrops and other techniques um, and really kind of just immersing you where you are at the railroad sure. Uh, sure. to give you that, that length of feel and that depth. Yeah. So that's um, definitely one thing I I did learn about the layout. Um, I think uh, as a NMRA and MMRA, if I can try to get that out early in the morning. Um, I think when you spoke to them some time ago, and we've got a sort of a picture up here on the screen um, of of the area that you're trying to model here. So, and it's one thing it became apparent, and I think I, I spoke to a gentleman. He's called the track planner, called uh, Bill. B Baranek, um from out of Colorado uh, a few months back, and that's one one of the the major top seven design elements he looks at when someone when he's putting a, a layout together, regardless of the of the the size of the room, is to try to to immerse someone within that scene, and by what you're saying, by putting curves in view blocks where it's large buildings or little alcoves as you say is a very very clever way of using the space and you need to be commended because some of the photos i've seen as i said 10 by 13 it looks three or four times bigger at least um than that so so well done with that that's definitely a, a really really nice design feature so what sort of motive power are you are you running yeah so uh the, the layout is or michigan air state uh, primarily uses just EMD exclusive uh, motor power. So second generation, modern day, um, you know, we roster everything from your, your GP 38 dash twos is your kind of your locals and, and, uh, yard service, uh, up to your modern power of your SD 70 aces that we use for the, uh, road trains, road freight. So it's, um, you know, trying to get that balance of a, of a profitable class two railroad, kind of like your, your MR, your Montana Rail Link out there that, you know, is doing a lot of uh, regional short line type work, but at the same time they also have a very up to date, uh, consistent uh, roster. And sure. so, yeah, twenty about twenty five engines I actually have modeled out of around a sixty seven actual hypothetical fleet. So about a third of the fleet's modeled, a little, right. little over a third. Yeah, lovely, lovely. So tell us some bit more facts and figures like. Um, how many turnouts? Because I know people like seem to like. <laughs> I've got a hundred turnouts on my layout type thing, or and everyone goes wow type thing. So, what sort of some some of the facts and figures like the um, the length of of the, the main line run or something like that? And sure, yeah. Um, so you know, being I mean, it's around the room. It's um, like I guess I think I calculated, including the helix. The helix really helps me add almost by 40 percent the length sure. of the run, run. So I guess you could say in one hundred eighty to two hundred foot main line run staging the staging so there's staging tucked in out, outside of where you can even see on the layout so it it makes for a decent run across the layout um average trains are about 14 cars yeah. and so the staging yards the main the yards the passing tracks uh, are all built to handle a 14 car train plus two engines so it's consistent to have a, a fluid railroad yeah, uh, during a session you know, so during a session, we're running around 12 to 13 trains, uh, kind of in sequential. Uh, I'll preload the staging area and also our originators and terminators out of the uh, Bay City Yard. Um, and then we'll process 140 to 100, sometimes even 150 cars uh, in a wow. session. Wow. And so we're, we, we definitely move a lot of freight across the railroad. The yard will turn itself at least over once during a session. Um, and, you know, we'll cut, we have a plan. But we kind of keep it flexible. So if uh, one destination starts bunching up like a prototype, yeah. we're going to call an extra. You know, we're going to work with it. We have this main stage on the railroad somewhere, uh, and we'll do that. And so that's – we kind of let let the plan start out, but then we'll just see where it evolves. And 
you know, is the yard master keeping up when you just start staging trains? And um, probably I would say turnout wise, estimating. That's a that's a good question. I've never actually counted, them. <laughs> but <laughs> I would say probably around 40, 40 turnouts. Wow. Um, yeah. The concentration of turnouts really is in the yard, a compound yard ladder. Yeah, sure. It's on curves uh, uh, for base city yard. That's where that's where the majority of your turnouts land. Um, and then really beyond that, I think people in the past, my goal was always to put more switches in, put more track in, and more industries. But I've realized and kind of scaled back over the years, more is not always better. Bigger is better. So yeah, yeah. maybe a larger industry that maybe has two long tracks versus, you know, a few short industries and trying to really, as I've redone and, and work through certain scenes to balance out um, what's plausible, what's real yeah, uh, sure. versus trying to put too much into it. And that's where it's been tough. I mean, it's been a tough discipline to say there's only really five modeled industries on the railroad actually sure. on the layout versus 10. But, you know, those five industries generate a lot of traffic. And so, um, you don't have to have a lot of Wednesday Tuesdays to be able to bring the volume you need for the railroad. Yeah, lovely. So you must be reading my mind because um, the next question I always like asking is, if you were to start this enterprise again, what would you do differently? You've sort of spoke about that briefly about the you know the, the size of some of the, the industries and the like. So I know if I was to start my layout again, I would try to have access all the way around the outside because I was... <laughs> It's quite embarrassing, but I I, I did a, a video of me where I got all excited about doing scenery up up the front end of uh, my layout and then realized I probably shouldn't have done that because there's all the scenery at the back end, which I'll literally have to lean across to get to. And so I did a tongue-in-cheek video on how not to do model railroad scenery, so that, that's quite, <laughs> quite amusing. So, um, and I had literally had my kids having to come up underneath the, uh, how I, I do like a an Elgerta sort of, set up with uh with the risers and all that for my my track base um along those lines and yeah anyway enough about that that's quite embarrassing but anyway we we move on so <laughs> I, I tell you so you know that's a great question um and i'm not one i, I i'm first off i'm not a modeler who normally will will sit there and i will not dwell on something and go i wish i could have done this because yeah. in the situation i we have in the time limited time with family and careers and jobs and everything else. I say this is the best in the situation I can per perform for the layout. And we move on, but I always have a list. So I yeah, would wish sure. I wish this, this room was about ten feet longer yeah, to create yeah. some longer runs where I could have some sweeping curves and put a little bit more distance between the towns. But really, from a a layout perspective, uh, I feel like the concept I've, I've captured here. I would love to just take this and to place it into a larger room uh, sure. because this here is still a lot of layout for one individual to maintain. Correct. Um, yeah. and that's a, that's a lot of, it's a lot of real estate. I'd probably add about double the staging tracks. Like they always say, um, add more staging tracks, but, um, uh, I, I've already kind of designed and started kind of designing a future layout. If I ever, we ever move to a larger home or have a, a better room, yeah, sure. I'll probably actually remodel this exact same railroad. Um, but go a little bit further, maybe 50 yeah, sure. miles of territory versus 30, and maybe a long gate between the stations to have a, a more of a more of a run. But that's that's about it. I mean, it's um, um, I think we're in the we're in the world's greatest hobby. Definitely, uh, we got definitely. amazing. There's amazing products and techniques, and um, I mean, look at NMRAX, the things that we people were doing for that, and just the, the content that is out there yeah, sure. um, helps really helps people hopefully bring those ideas and wishes to reality now um, seeing what others have done and, and engaging in um, I tell you having relationships I think that's another really important thing of the hobby definitely, definitely. and not regretting not having those now and, and establishing those now because those are lifelong friendships and relationships that uh, I think regardless of where your layout is you're able to take those and, and to really um, and build upon those and, and, and network with other individuals who are like-minded yeah, so. definitely, definitely. Yeah, I don't, I don't know who coined the phrase. I think it was Lionel Strang or someone along those lines on AML on his podcast. And I like to, you know, take other people's um, intellectual property, so to speak. But I think he coined the phrase of no matter where you are in the world, no matter what your vocation is, 
if you like the Michigan interstate, you'll have a friend for life type type scenario, and then because you, you've got something in common, and I think that's where this hobby is is the world's greatest hobby. I don't think there's another hobby out there that has just about every aspect of um, every aspect that you can build with. You got electronics, you got you got scenery, you've got operations, you've got the art side of things with just you know you got weathering and uh, woodwork and all sorts of all sorts of vocations that you you can you can bring to this hobby but um it's just very interesting that um the way we all sort of interacting like this you know you and I uh doing this today um was just fantastic and I think moving forward I don't like to dwell on the the covid stuff too much but I think it has highlighted the the use of some technology that we can use and we will continue to use that for forever in a day I think absolutely and um, I love the, you know, the, the photos you're showing are amazing. So some of those, I got, I got to take credit for a lot of them, but some of those are actually um, on Tom Patterson's Chesapeake, Wheeling, and Erie. Sure. Uh, I had a chance to visit him up in Ohio. Oh, yeah. Lovely. Um, and so I was up there for, for, for um, a business, and I had a few extra day, uh, extra day. And so I met up with them and brought a whole grain train with me. So we literally oh, tied lovely. together a story of a Michigan interstate grain train going from Michigan to Virginia to the, to the Atlantic. And part of it was operating across Tom Patterson's, uh, yeah, lovely. Chesapeake, Milan and Erie as, as part of that whole. And so that's some of the photos here. So he's getting some free publicity. I know yeah. if the guys <laughs> I'll share with them, they'll be, they'll be, they'll be grinning. Yeah, but, yeah. um, you know, just, just, just go to show, you know, where the hobby, um, how we, we make these friendships and relationships and how it all kind of, we, it really is a small world. Oh, definitely. Uh, that we get to share with everyone and in, in a, in a shared interest. So, yeah, some some amazing. I mean, hit in some of the you know I think that you know some of the things I'm doing on mine are amazing. But uh, you know his his mountain scenery and like that one of the photos here is also with Dean Ferris's end scale, sure. uh, Oregon joint mine. Some of the scenery that these gentlemen have created uh, is a true inspiration for myself and for others. And that's yeah, definitely. That's it's a lot a lot of it. So yeah, it's just kind of. You just it's just create more uh, opportunities to have more folks to, to, to chat with you about uh, their layouts. That's right. That's right. And it's and as I said um, off off camera before, um, majority of you know gentlemen. Um, I've had one lady. I had Michelle Kempner from Colorado Motor Road Model Railroad Museum on here twice, and she's going to come back on probably in November sometime and run a whole operations train as they as they do on their railroad. Um, I'm really looking forward to that, but. Everyone is willing to share. There's, we got, as I said, we got the technology to now bring this this hobby forward um, and try to, you know, because you and I we're reasonably young. We're probably on the younger end of the scale compared to to some of them. So um, I'm in my mid forties. I think you're probably a fair bit younger than that by the looks of it. But um, uh, my mid thirties. That's mid thirties. <laughs> Yeah, the gray hair is not showing. No, that's <laughs> right. I got a little bit of salt and pepper on the side here, but that's that's for another day. So, I think that's the, you know the world's best hobby. I think is I know it's been you know there's actually a, a show called the world's best hobby. I think that's probably the, the way to describe it, and then that's why I'm hoping some of the younger crew do get in younger than us. Even you know it's you know it's got it's got the computer aspect now, which I'm heavily into. And it's got you know the tactile model building, and I just think it's it's got everything. This hobby, and yes. don't care what anyone says. <laughs> yes, I mean uh, you want to build boats, you can. That's you right. You can be a marine modeler too. I, I had a you know one of the photos you have there is of my yeah, lake, yeah. my five foot long lake freighter. Yeah, I saw uh, that. that I'm, I'm constructing, and that was you know it's a whole other concept outside of model rarity because you got a vacuum form plastic kit, and you have to yeah. sand that down and. Um, you really do develop, you know, those are those are the kind of um, opportunities that you're presented in your hobby that help um, and in your, your modeling career that help kind of push you forward in, in your skill level because sure. you may not understand or have that skill set yet, um, but by the time you start doing that model to get to your attained endpoint, uh, you're going to learn that skill set, and then you're you know, you're, you're greater for for taking that big leap, um, that's, that's exactly right. Multi- whatever it is, I, yeah. I did when I was researching, obviously through some of your photos. I did did see the that um, that river freighter that you had the the boat that you're building, or well, hardly a boat, a ship. 
<laughs> yes. And I saw how, how long it was. I did a, a video on a, um, an art, it's called the brand is an Artitech, which is a European brand of a coaster. And this were, that was two and a half feet long. And I struggled as it was trying to get enough real estate to build this thing let alone a you know something that's over twice the length um yes it's but then i had this trouble is you know that i'm trying to videotape i was trying to i actually did three three videos on how i built it but it's quite interesting you know that the the techniques you might not have but you learn and i know there's a an indian gentleman called uh gustav chatterjee he does trains and dioramas he did this barge series that um and he's an end scaler american end scaler he, he lives in india um that he did this beautiful little scratch built barge um, in all styrene and cardboard. And then the way he weathered, weathered that boat up uh, was amazing. So I did follow through and with some of his techniques. I also went through to some of the military modelers where some of the scale um, American warships that uh, these uh, ladies and gentlemen are building are absolutely phenomenal. And some of the techniques they use are just off, off the charts that you could purely used for either something of a boat or a ship or going through to weathering, you know, rolling stock and locomotives, I think. It's just, I think we come under this banner of modelers and then obviously we have all our niches and sub-niches within that and then I think it's just sort of nice how it's sort of this current world with the internet is just meshing it all together and we're just pulling out little bits and pieces from various sub-niches to to broaden our own skills, so to speak. Yes, yes. Yeah, you mentioned military. I'll just real quick on that. Yeah, I'm starting to work on a, uh, a military unit train of, of tanks and, and vehicles. Okay. And um, I got approached by a, a few guys that are in the modeling community that I know through Facebook. And they said, hey, you know, we're we kind of are experts in, in getting these uh, rolling stock of military equipment decked out properly. And I said, I have no idea where to turn, so please help me. And it's amazing just that whole nother, it's a whole nother, uh, you know, even in 187 scale, it's a whole nother branch of the hobby in just military modeling. And uh, and those guys do some fantastic work. They do, yeah. Uh, that uh, is, it's going to be very impressive when it's done. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So... Another very, very interesting concept uh, um, that you brought up. I think you said, well, when you did the, the clinic on, no, it was what's neat this week with Mr. Patterson. Um, you mentioned, obviously, they had the soundtrack gentleman there, and his name eludes me, uh, George Bog Bogatar, I think. Bogatar, I think it is, something yep, similar. That's great, yep. Um, where you mentioned that you use all the one type of decoder for consistency um yes. can you sort of explain the the methodology behind that because i think that's very quite interesting and in, in subtopic in itself yes and uh, it's so funny you mentioned that because i've had some recent facebook conversations about that specifically but um you know there is there's a lot of great first off there's a lot of great decoder manufacturing on the market and i'm not trying to detract from any of them but um i think with any system or technology system um you have a learning curve whether it's sure. dsu soundtracks tcs and um I've, for the longest time i've really spent a lot of time spending working in soundtracks and you know i've tried to um matching soundtracks engines whether it's soundtracks early tsunamis to the tsunami twos or the economies they all have a common denominator right it's a soundtracks product it's Soundtricks algorithms, all their systems. And so there is a similarity that allows for, you know, the boards, they're very similar in how they're installed, how they're set up. And so from the installation consistency, I'm very familiar with the look or how much how much room they take up in a, in a locomotive. Um, same with programming. I use JMRI Decoder Pro. Um, cool. I'm able to, you know, share and, and copy and paste some of those CV values from one to the other. And so it just makes for um, a consistent sound, you know, and, and people go, well, there's always a, a issue of like the, the prime movers making like a harmonic sound because they're all the same. But I will I'll give it to George and his team, the team there that the pitch shift 
that the Sami 2 has allows you to change that pitch. And so no, you know, no 645 turbo on an SD42-2 has to sound the same. You know, they can all have a little bit different pitch. And if you listen to the prototype, very few of them all sound exactly the same because every engine is bored out differently. And so it just comes back to simplicity, I think, for uh, education, uh, understanding the, 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 the CVs, concepts, the gremlins, of course. There's always gremlins with everything. <laughs> um, and, and just own that product as a, as a customer, own it. Um, because I tried ESU and I tried TCS and they're, they're great products, but I wasn't familiar with them. And, yeah, sure. you know, to do that, you're going to spend three times the amount of time versus I know soundtracks and, and continue to develop myself there. And then it, it really just ties back at the end to time management. And what yeah. do you want to spend your time in the hobby on? Cool. Um, I, I, you know, if you want to spend a lot of time doing programming, you could probably, you could probably learn them all. But if you, you're doing a layout and sound and uh, other, like, you know, your control system is a whole other animal of, you know, consistency of what do you choose for product line, it's track work, scenery. Um, I just made the decision it's easier to save on one. And then I, that learning curve is reduced, you know, tenfold to a consistent product. It also helps with relationships. You know, I've got no no George yeah, sure. at Soundtracks, yeah. and so I can reach back and say, "Hey, I'm having some issues," or the Soundtracks team. And as a as a owner, I can also be a little bit more educated and not as ignorant, and you know, and talking about the product. Like, hey, I'm having this issue on this part of the board. You know, versus I know the nomenclature for what is that Soundtrack product. So it just really kind. Of, I think in the end, take all that information, all those reasons why. It's it's really about time management and just yeah, making sure. the most of your time your hobby time. Yeah, so oh, that's that makes uh, that makes perfect sense. I'm a, an ESU man. Um, I haven't delved into the very new ESU Dakotas because everything's got Dakotas at this point in time. I'm not going to keep replacing them because they get rather expensive if you're going to keep changing each time a new version comes out, so to speak. So, um, but you're right. You sort of you learn an interface. I don't know Dakota Pro all that well, but I know the lock sound interface quite well uh, for what better yeah. serves my purposes traditionally ESU started out from a European background as well as my understanding and then obviously that's branched into to the American American scene as well so um, yeah that's very very interesting uh, points that you raise there that's for sure so and, and I think if you know if I had started out with ESU I, it would probably be on a different uh, on different you know to see be the same yeah, or sure. a different shoe on the same foot right just be doing something different but you know, soundtracks is where I started, and that's where yeah, I, sure. I, I stayed. Um, you know, and folks are discouraged sometimes by that because of the cost. And I always tell folks, well, the, the coders that you do not want to keep, don't destroy them. Remove them properly. You can sell them used because the right person who wants TCS Correct. or ESU, Correct. That, that's going to be a bargain for them. You know, yeah, it's a, you know get, sell at a, a deal where you're making some money on it. Is it going to pay for your entire decoder refinancing of your of soundtracks no but yeah. it will help you um finance part of that cost sure. and helping you try to attain toward a, a homogenous fleet of of the same decoders so another interest of yours appears to be the, a signaling system um i yes. think you've got quite a prototypical signaling system on the St. Clair Div division, that's for sure. But what I can see, I'm not an, an American signaling expert by any stretch of the imagination. But I think in our initial conversations, you mentioned that you worked with John Parsons from Azatrax. Um, I've got some of his um, infrared um, modules on my layout for, mm -hmm. for, a, for my shunting side of things or my uncoupling magnets. And I've recently had John on the show as well, and had a had a brief chat with him about uh, his products. So, yes. sort of work us through what products you use of John's or as a tracks. And if people are not aware, I will put um, a link below. Not this is not a sponsored link or anything. I just think they're rock solid, really nice products with a gentleman that is more than happy to help you out in any shape or form. I think we give uh, a shout out to to young John as well. Yes, yeah. So. Um... That's a great. That's a great uh, topic. So, on the Michigan Interstate, what we have is a, a very. It's a simple four aspect ABS or automatic block signaling system, and we use the 
Azatrax, the basis of it is the Azatrax TS2 uh, block signal detection and, and driving system. So um, that is a great system for anyone that just wants to dabble in signals and, and not get too far in and, and learn simple concepts and then always continue to, to uh, get deeper in. So um, the layout is made up of about, about seven TS2 blocks. Um, so basically, when the, when the trains leave Bay City and they begin to climb up the helix eastbound to Port Huron, they enter an ABS. So that one photo you have uh, of the curve, that's actually the beginning signal of the ABS system as they go up the helix. So the helix sure. is controlled by ABS and all across the upper deck uh, through the, the passing siding. Um, and so I, I reached out to John well, probably four years ago or so, and uh, I said, hey, I love your product. But I haven't been able to really see it. I can't find it on the web. I can't find anyone else really using it. I'm trying to get more examples and ideas to build my confidence in installing something like this. And he goes, well, it's really quite simple. I read through the directions. And so we came to an agreement. Um, John, uh, I did a four- or five-part post on my blog. It's still actually out yeah, there on the Michigan Interstate St. Clair sub-blog. And I basically walked through – um, progressive steps that every step was a little bit more in, in complexity and how you could start with one block, one simple automatic block with two signals and you could add to it and add to it and add to it. And you could scale yourself up from a very simple setup to as complex as you wanted in using John's TS2 um, system as that basis. And so um, I use a TS2 system with uh, NJ International and BMLA block signals. Right. Uh, and so we, we did some crazy things at like a, a switch where if you threw the switch, it changed, it, it changed uh, literally instead of driving two signal heads, it drove four. And so we actually, John added, make some changes to the board to allow for that kind of uh, voltage and, and that kind of work because it was not designed yeah, sure. to do that. And uh, a lot of the things that I think we kind of – I worked with him on and he pioneered. He's, he's, he's a pioneering guy in the signal in the IR area. Um, eventually, with I think myself and some other clubs, kind of turned into the TS3 um, signaling system he has now. So he has um, boards now that help you do just about every kind of interlocking aspect, whether it's a crossover yeah, or sure. a diamond or – all kinds of switches and variations. So it was kind of the beginning of, I think John kind of broke that out. And so we, we broke it a few times. We knew it didn't work. <laughs> yeah. um, but you know, ultimately John took that and he went much further with the TS3. And so here this last uh, couple of months ago, I purchased some of those TS3s from him. And so where the, the passing siding is, each of the switches on the east end and the west end that had four signal heads, they're being upgraded now with, uh, with the new TS3 system, which is designed for four signal heads versus the kind of uh, uh, jerry-rigged system that we had done for the TS2 at, at the time. But sure. we were developing and kind of pioneering what, you know, what did that look like. And so I'd ask a lot of questions and uh, he'd go, I don't know the answer. I need to find out. And so a lot of development kind of took place and uh, it's a great partnership and it was a great, uh, great friendship uh, came with it. And, and John's an amazing guy. So yeah, He's as a track's yeah. You know, just a uh, uh, plug to those guys, you know, his, his product is, it's sound, it's very affordable and it allows people to, uh, you know, get into signaling without having to get into the, if you want to do detection, you can, but it, it's, uh, it's a nice, um, stepping stone into doing something larger or, or if this is sure. all you want, it's really very easy to use with IR. So. Yeah, sure, sure. So your signaling system is a sort of a standalone system. It's not linked in with, I think you run JMRI for your op sessions as well, or is it? Correct. It, it is standalone, so it is not dispatcher controlled or it's not sure. indicated. Uh, the signals will, you know, will knock themselves down based on, you know, where the trains are and, and the blocks. Um, and so the, the radio itself is actually dispatched by a dispatcher using uh, a whiteboard right now or we'll eventually be using cats jmri like a a, a, a dispatcher screen a d dummy screen but right yeah. now it's a, it's a whiteboard with a, with a sharpie or a, a yeah, um, yeah. and so dtc is really how the authority is issued to the trains the abs is really a safety overlay on top of that um, sure, that dispatching sure. so 
Yeah, lovely, yep. lovely. So it's probably a, quite a good segue into obsessions because that's obviously another passion of yours that this layout yes. appears that it's pretty well been built for operations in mind. And I, yeah. you know, I had a, um, a quick look at uh, undertaking. I think back in July you were on NMRX with Gordy and, and crew. And you sort of went through your operating sessions, and obviously we could probably spend another hour just on the op session. So I'm trying to condense that down. But one thing I thought was absolutely fascinating with your presentation was the what was the backstory, or how did you come up with? I think it's the the flex you brought up, um, the flex methodology of yeah, the flex methodology. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, so basically, Can you tell us something you know, about that. So. That's a, that's a great question. So I sat down when when the when when Gert Mueller Speed, his name, yeah, the name, speed, he asked yeah. me. He said, "Can you do a can you do a session about your ops?" I said, "Sure." So I, I sat down one night and I thought, you know, the layout is flexible, and it just kind of popped in my head to use, you know, the word flex, and you know, to first first learn, you know, find what you want to do, right? Identify it, learn about it. Um, execute on it you know build a layout operate a layout and then you know cross-examine you know go back get feedback continually up improve on yourself and within that flex methodology you know that i offered and that's a great um session to go back and look at on the nmrax's website but you know really you can scale up or scale down your training operations from one operator to five operators all depend on what you want to do. And that was really kind of the genesis of that is, is trying to give inspiration to others. To, it can be a one-person operation. You can still have a lot of things, and you have choices on where you can land with paperwork, operations, execution of the planning, uh, or you know just finding what you want to model. Do you want to model class one or a short line or something freelance? Um and that's that's really kind of the genesis behind the whole flex ops terminology and, and methodology, was just to to hopefully get some inspiration out there and, and create some uh, creative juices in people's brains that oh yeah I, I can I can I shouldn't be you know discouraged I can I'm encouraged I can be encouraged by this and I can take what Greg's provided me here and and start penciling in my ideas and hopefully and, and the goal was to get folks to build a layout and have fun yeah lovely lovely oh um i'll put a link to to that flex system below the reason i asked i thought it was a fascinating concept and sort of a framework as you as one of a better phrase to, to put a layout together so to speak particularly an operational layout so it's, it's quite interesting that you you've actually formalized something very similar i suppose that i have done myself i'm sort of a lone wolf modeler uh, building quite a large layout, but I use a, a program called Train Controller, which is a German-based mm -hmm. software. Uh, it's a bit like JMRI, which is setting up sequencing and schedules and the like, where I can have up to probably 10 operators running separate trains, but then I can bring that right down to almost running the layout with just one or two of us by either having manual trains fully manually running between point A and point B, or mm -hmm. fully automatic between point A and point B, then you just do all the fun stuff like um, I like shunting and you know the the operate the sorry the paperwork side of things. So yeah, it's a um, very very interesting way that you've described how to look at putting a layout together, so to speak. Yes, yeah, yeah. It was, it was a lot of fun to to have a chance to kind of sit down and put you know for all these years you know things that I've I've, I've put in concept and actually execute on the Michigan Interstate. Sure. And uh, with others, you know, being involved in helping kind of cross-examine and, and get that feedback and provide feedback to sit down and go, okay, what does this actually look like from a, an outline? Yeah. And that's really kind of genesis into that flex. And I'm really glad it turned out well. And I'm hoping that uh, we, we keep we keep talking about it. I'm glad you brought it up. I hope we keep talking about it further with uh, with others as well. No, definitely. Uh, I literally just came across it when I was watching the NMRA um, X scenario. Um, when I was looking into to this, I've never heard of it before, but I'll definitely put the link below because it's definitely something that people can build their a framework to build their layout against. That's definitely for sure. So, um, which comes into nicely. Obviously, the flexibility of the layout is quite important, particularly in these times. You've probably 
glad that you sort of spent the time and the effort of being having a layout that is flexible from operations point of view with obviously you can't have your up to I think five ob operators within your your layout room yeah. makes it a little bit more difficult right now with current current climate but um, so just to reiterate even though we're only talking about a, a medium sized layout here you're still running 130 cars 12 trains up to um, up to numbers here in an operating session so that's obviously going to be very very busy busy room when uh, when everyone's there yeah oh it's yeah it becomes very busy um, and, and the best part is you know I can it can do that with two operators or three or even myself you know I just it's it being in the road is kind of sequentially set up even with yeah, the staging lovely. you know I can it, it would take me about probably a month you know, with a couple, you know, a couple, you know, maybe 30 minutes a night or whatever, yeah. have to switch everything on my own, but probably over maybe two weeks to a month, you know, yeah. I could, I could completely, you know, do a full session on my own, um, which yeah, with, with, uh, Corona is what it is. Yeah. Um, uh, it's, it's kind of more or less what's happened. You know, there's been a lot of cards that have been added to the layout since the last op session. And, um, so I, I, in a way I've kind of had to thin the herd and, and manage the layout. Uh, like it was actually in ops so yeah sure sure so what sort of documentation for an op session or take corona out of it say you're running a full operation session um sort of documentation that you're running on the st Clair? sure yeah uh, so i use jmri operations and so that is the the basis of the car management system uh so that's kind of in the flex plan as well but car management train management Sure. Um, I use I use the JMRI for that, so it does all the uh, industry routing based on need or you know, how I've set it up. Also built the trains and the train manifests, so that's that's all done through JMRI Ops. But then in, in addition to that, uh, on the layout, um, you can never have enough documentation. Like the Prototype Railroads, they have playbooks and yeah, track yeah. charts and diagrams. It's important for the operators to know where they are. I mean, as sure. as the owner, the designer, you know, we we have our own layouts. We know where everything's at because we put yeah. it there. But you know, to the individual who's come over for maybe once a quarter, they don't. Um, so every so at every station on the layout, there is a station card that's mounted on the fascia that has a track plan of where's the main line at, east west orientation for understanding where you are, um, all the industries, and then. In addition to that, there's an industry card um, on the layout and like a little pocket. Um, and basically, so if you're going to go switch, I'll say Huron Gas, for example, that receives propane cars, you know, the operator that works at a local that serves that facility at Gray's Lake, he would pull the industry card and would tell them, okay, you can spot up to three cars. There's three spots, spot under the, you know, um, the rack. You have to use also a buffer car between the loaded hazmat and the locomotive. So, right, okay. You know, you kind of drive down from high level. You know, like your train manifest. You drive down to granular detail at the actual industry in the station. Um, and so the operators also have timetables. They have a uh, on the back of their train card. So there's a train card on top of their manifest. There's a train card. It's actually printed out on and laminated. And it tells them the name of their train, what's the purpose of their train. Uh, maximum cars, tonnage, length. Where does it go? What op what blocks does it operate over? So it kind of gives them a step by step. Okay, I got this manifest port here or basically the port here on train. What work will I need to do, and where? And then how will I get across the railroad? And sure. very much spell it out for them, and they can you know talk to the dispatcher and say I need these three or four DTC blocks to begin their train movement to the next station. So yeah, no. um, yeah definitely trying to make sure, you know, you, you, and it's, it's daunting when you stop and go back and look at all the paperwork required, even for a layout of this size and the scope. Uh, it is, it is mind blowing how much paperwork is actually required to effectively run a model railroad, if yeah. you will, but calamity. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So I definitely haven't gone. I'm still, trying to build my layout and sort of just dabble with the whole operations thing where I've got, I use sort of a switch list and a sort of a, it's like a way bill sort of system to route my, yep. um, my wagons over, over the layout. I'm, 
I've run a, a, a few trains sort of with that system and I'm still trying to develop where I've, I've got the right mix with the right amount of cars out and about and the right amount of cars sitting in staging and the right amount of cars might be sitting in a yard scenario. But So it's uh, definitely a work in progress, but I use a, a barcoding system as well to populate my switch lists where I've got yep. each one of my wagons. I'd, I wrote a barcoding sort of program and you just scan them and it just populates out in the and it seems to work. I don't, then obviously then you don't have to write a switch list for every, every session. It's um, a lot quicker. You just zap it with the, the barcode scanner, which is great. So, But I definitely haven't gone to, to the level or the extreme that you have here. Um, that's that's to come, I think. So when we get moving forward with proper operations on my layout, that's for sure. So, And, and, I, and I would say, you know, JMR operations, I like it. And there's a lot of other individuals who have used it. Um, notably, John Parker and his, his Fall River Division uh, sure. BNSF layout. Um, and he always says, you know, when I first started doing it, he said, read the instructions once, twice, three times, and then read them a fourth time. Yeah. And so whenever I would, when I would travel for work, I would always take them, uh, <laughs> take that big old 80-page packet with me. Yeah, yeah. And that would, that would make for light reading on the airplane. Yeah, uh, awesome. And just to make sure, you know, and, and so it's interesting, you read over it, and maybe there's something you didn't catch before. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, because usually it's you know when I find an error in JMR ops, it's not because the the program did it wrong, it's because the uh, the user, yeah, I did not set the parameters properly. So, you know, that's and that's you know it's also once again it comes back to like your like your decoders, sure. you can spend a lot of time you know in that, or you can do a, a real basic switch list or yeah, you know four cycle car cards. It yeah. really comes down to it as the operator is what is the, what is I guess what is your intention right? What is uh you know that in the whole F in the, yeah. the flex that is, you know, that's figuring right. out what do you want. Yeah, that's right. So, also, I, I when I was researching this, you something was quite resounding, and I've never seen this being done before. Is obviously when a train's coming out of your staging, there's occasions where your operators have no idea what's going to be on that train. So what I mean by that is you've got some, what they call, I think, tell me if I'm wrong, low and high loads in your part of the world where... High, high and wide, yeah. High and wide, sorry, that's the one, high and wide. So I thought that was quite interesting. And then the ones I mean, the, the photos are flicking through here every now and again. You do a sort of a double flat car that's got a um, a wind turbine blade on it, So, which obviously has its own issues when you're negotiating curves and all that old thinking the speeds and everything, the way they're controlling the layout. So can you tell us about some of these loads that uh, that you throw into your, your operators to, to keep them on their toes? Yeah, so to sure. So the, uh, so, so the dimensional loads always add a unique aspect. It's just like they do in the prototype because they are, they're, lar they're larger cars, they're heavier, longer. Um, and that's, that's really kind of what drives them as being dimensional. But, the wind train is a really interesting train. It's uh, 10, 10 cars, and the, the blades are around, I think what we, we would, I think it would be around about a 35 meter blade. Sure. So they're not not very long. Um, and so on, on that train, to really get the, the feel of a, a large wind blade on a flat car, out here, in, out here in, the, in the States, we're running blades that are, you know, 240 feet, 74 yeah, meter sure. length. So. You know, they're, that's three flat cars, essentially. But, you know, trying to take that to a limited scope layout, like the Michigan Air State, the size, uh, that blade does not look very good on an 89-foot flat car. So I end up using oh. uh, two Atlas 68-foot cars. So that blade spans both those cars relatively well. Um, your, your end overhang, the tip of that blade doesn't go out too far, and since the load does bridge between two cars and it's dynamic, you know, I wanted to minimize how much bridging um, there was. And, and so that was, that was a lot of fun to kind of put that together and use that uh, American model. The builders uh, have a, it's a fantastic laser, laser wood plastic uh, resin kit. That they make the wind generators, yeah. the wind hubs and the, um, and the blades. And so you'll put that together um, and it's always fun for the operators to, to, to operate that because they never know um, it's a unit symbol, right? And so I, I my coal trains, my my grain trains, 
they all use init symbols. So they don't really know what it is until it kind of comes out of the staging. They go, oh, it's the blade train or versus it's the coal train. Um, and that's that's exciting. And I do have a few of those. I have some pole loads. I have some utility pole loads that um, that's what we call a, a double end overhang load. And so that's a, about a hundred about a hundred foot long utility wood poles. And it sits on a 68 foot car. And so since it has a double end overhang over each of the ends, um, it has two idler cars to go with it yeah. to protect those uh, end overhangs. So it wouldn't, it wouldn't damage a, an adjacent car. So, but sure. you know, when, when operating those, you know, it requires a little bit more diligence for the, for the crews on, you know, adjacent tracks, making sure that they can clear, you know, through the yard. We, we usually don't route those through the yard. Yeah, sure. <laughs> to keep them on the main line. <laughs> and that's something that even the prototypes do. They want to, you know, reduce risk uh, yeah, when sure. moving uh, that very that very sensitive and very expensive and high dollar uh, dimensional product. Oh, so Yeah, for sure, sure. You definitely got some very unique loads. Now I keep going back to when I was I, I tried to look into learning about someone's modeling and all that, and it's that is why probably the thing I like about the most is just learning about different things obviously the flex we we keep coming back on and my daughter actually picked up on this and i got 11 year old daughter she was looking at through some of the photos because i got like she's like my my quality control when i'm running all my my, my slide shows and the like and she goes he's using glitter in one of those wagons and i said a model railroader <laughs> would not use glitter in one of their wagons so that's just not and then i actually i think it was an mra ax um scenario i think he bought up or was it um I think, it was, yeah, I think it was, uh, yeah. Oh, oh, there it is baby. just popping up now. And, yes. And sure yes. enough, you use glitter. So I had to eat my, she goes, why don't you do that? I could do this glitter and all on the outside. No, you're not putting glitter on. <laughs> so tell us about some of your unique loads. Yeah, so that one there you talked about um, is a glass cullet load. And sure. um, to fit the bill from an HO scale perspective of scale, glitter um, from your local craft store, like a bluish uh, silver yeah. glitter, was about the closest thing you could get to um, glass cullet, which is you know crushed up glass from yeah, models sure. or whatever it is. And uh, you know there is a prototype for it, and kind of did some research on the on the actual prototype down there, Brownwood, Texas, that reserve that actually receives the uh, the glass cullet, and you know they make them into like marbles for like sandblasting. So. Um, mm -hmm. It was interesting to see because you I've seen before a model railroader, you know, like on their beer line and other um, other uh, uh, layouts, you know, hey, there's a cullet track. So, yeah, sure. you know, it's we always we always saw the outbound cullet from wherever it was originally maybe a brewery or somewhere else, but you know, it, this here's kind of a neat way to model it, uh, kind of transiting to its next destination. So we got that, got the pole load. Yeah. Uh, there's a. I have a load of a center beam of aluminum. Yeah, sure. Basically, it's like aluminum um, spheres or cylinders. Oh, yeah, like yeah. That. And those are that's really the kind of extruded aluminum, and that's a very heavy car, and that's actually all uh, K and S pipe. So that's I, I was actually done by a friend who does an amazing job uh, with making uh, right there. Yeah, making making loads, and uh, you know the best part about it is is you don't have to do these amazing loads. You don't have to. You can look track side, look for photos, but um, on the American so on the American Association of Railroads website, uh, the open top loading rules called the OTLR right. is a okay. online guide, and you can just go th and just go through. I mean, uh, cal I mean, page and chapter after chapter of hundreds of different load variations of yeah. the different interesting things that have been loaded. And how to properly secure them. It's all public on PDF, so you can right. literally choose a load and figure out. I want to model this, and, and then going? really the hardest part is then trying to figure out what what materials are you going to use to make that model. Yeah, but sure. uh, you know, so you don't have to try to reinvent the wheel. It's all there for you. But yeah, that was a that was a unique one. I have a I have a big twenty axle Schnabel car. Uh, I don't operate very often. It's one of the Bachman <laughs> ones. It's yeah. an amazing model. It's a great uh, shelf queen, but uh, because it, it operates uh, with such long truck centers, it's just a long car, um, it does take curves and it bridges. And, I mean, it really does swing in on a curve. So um, <laughs> on a layout like mine, it's tough to operate on, yeah, but sure. it, it looks amazing. And it, it really does uh, 
bring the feel of the real 20 axles with the loads that are suspended on each end. So it's a really neat model. Yeah, sure, sure. So we'll bring up your your website. So macrail.com. Uh, so macrailproducts.com, as I um, yes, put yep. the link below. Make sure I get it right. Um, tell us how this has come about, this this little sure. pot- cottage business, I suppose. Yeah, so uh, I guess, you know, with a lot of things, uh, you know, with coronavirus, I had a lot more time to model. So I had things, and I'm not sure why it's looking sideways, but... Uh, yeah, it's on the website that I way for some reason. The anyway. website does some really odd things, but um, anyways... The macro products kind of came about back in March. Um, I wanted to, I was modeling a, a corrugated paper plant and I needed about 120 paper rolls. <laughs> well, making the dial rods didn't work out very well. So I knew a friend who had a 3D printer. I said, Hey, can you make me some cylinders? And, uh, you know, I gave him the heights and we made them. And so I said, Oh, can we maybe make some pedestals for a, a hospital rec flat? He said, sure. And then, um, so we, we kind of kept making 3D prints. Like, hey, we're just going to make these things. And, you know, with uh, being coronavirus, you're kind of not going, very, going really anywhere. So we had to be kind of creative and resourceful. And so I would kind of draw it up and design it. And he would then put it in the 3D and, and then print it for me. And sure. kind of get this, uh, he's an N-scaler. I'm an HO scaler. So we kind of have a little partnership in our garages here in Texas. And uh, long story short, um, I had been messing with trying to make an EOT since like uh, early February. I want to make one for my I visited Tom Harrison's layout. I didn't have a chance to. And so it was on my list of things to do during coronavirus. Sure. And sure. so we got photos and getting references. Uh, me and a uh, gentleman named Marshall, I said, what if we made an EOT that fits into a coupler? And so around 21 versions later, we had tried everything from mountain over the top of the coupler to the outside. Yeah. And there's so many variables with how long the coupler shank is sure. um, to the coupler heights and, and different things. Um, we eventually settled on designs that have geometry that basically fit into a KD type coupler. So one fits into what I call like a regular type coupler, your KD5, uh, and the other fits into more of a scale, a KD58. Um, and so we created two different versions of EOTs, modern, it's a modern version, um, comes in seven colors. And so we thought we got to we'll do some EOTs and then, uh, we got to have a storage rack since those are, you know, now being used in a session. Um, and, you know, they're, you know, the opera is actually taking up, twisting them on, twist them off. So they're very durable. They're easy to use, easy to see. They are a little bit larger than the actual skate EOT. And that's by design um, for the utility of actually held them in your fingers and installing on a freight car. Uh, they had to be a little bit larger. If not, they were too small. You know, they could break. Um, it'd be too hard to see for someone who's kind of visually impaired. We want to make sure that they had the opportunity to enjoy having an EOT on their train as well. So yeah, sure. uh, we made them a little bit bigger, but they turned out great. They're durable. They're a lot of fun. They come in packs of three for 20 bucks, U.S. dollars. We, uh, we, we made racks, so there's also 3D printer racks. I print in yellow, like a yellow, uh, like a safety yellow, and also a aluminum. And they come, I hand br- I actually hand uh, dry brush weather them. So they come weathered, ready to go, ready to install in your layout. So trying to, you know, think of these neat ideas that um, had not been in the market and bring the market and then also bring the market ready to go. So those EOTs are hand-painted. They are out of the package. They are ready to use some at the racks. And then we also uh, added some flags. And those are uh, piano wire, hand-bent piano wire with uh, like a a construction marking flagging tape. So it's a very flexible, durable, thin tape, about as thin as you can get for the material science of an HO scale and in red and orange. So you can can easily hang a flag on the back of your train no matter what uh, what area you're modeling. Yeah, sure, Um, sure. Yeah, so and so that kind of just branched off into you know other things. So we've done the EOTs, the flags, the racks, um, and you know I, I'm a modern modeler. I want seller panels for my balance card, which is a very popular thing in the states. No one offered those, so I offer ten different versions of solar panels based on different prototypes that are offered on class one short lines. 
bells can door control boxes. Um, here's here's a good example of one of the EOTs. That's a that's a 901 RT. It's kind of the most popular version. That's the orange regular kitty five coupler version. Um, and then you know we've so we've done all the, uh, the solar panels. They come with custom decals. They're painted gloss. So literally you can out of the package you install them and you add the decal and you are good to go on having a, a modeled solar panel on your car. And so just bring in some of the more modern things that uh, accessories oh, yeah. that people look for, like PTC antennas for your locomotives. Um, we're, we're looking at, you know, we're working on right now, we're working really hard on, um, on uh, lids for gondolas of all sizes. So I know, I know there's some Australians who have reached out to me that love um, to do more mining modeling yeah. Yeah. and they need, uh, they need lids. So we're working really hard on um, lids for different size hoppers and gons that are, um, they kind of mimic the, modern fiberglass lids you see out on the railroad so right. it's, it's, been, it's been a lot of fun so just looking for you know really looking for uh, opportunities that are not modeled in the market to bring them to market um and we know it's a lot more of a niche uh market to forget an eot but you know by working in 3d printing we're able to work in smaller scale batches and allows us to bring um that scalability of a product market of, of product uh, out there to the, to the market and um, we're we're in now in we're in um, let's see we have a, a Canadian distributor uh, RG model trains um, in the states uh, making tracks HO scale trains up in the mid Atlantic and uh, we are also in stock at a uh, Spring Creek model trains in Nebraska and um, and the mainline hobby supply up in Pennsylvania is uh, also in the midst of becoming a, 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 a dealer. So I'm actually filling, the, filling their order. So, you know, so now there's two places, one on one's east and one west of Mississippi that we are in stock uh, at a brick and mortar store, yeah, which is great. And uh, it's been a lot of fun. It's been a, it's been a really fun, uh, you know, idea to turn into just a small uh, part-time business uh, and bringing some really neat products to the, the marketplace. Yeah, sure. As I said, I've never... As I said, I don't model this side of things. I've never, never seen these, but I can see how something like this is needed within a given prototype, so to speak, or whatever. As in, you say, Australian ore trains, um, which is quite interesting. I think now looking at it, they run in New South Wales or, or sort of the eastern states from me, anyway. So that's uh, that's great. So, so yeah. it's you and a you and a, a business partner, or is it your three D printer, or is it? No, no. So um, I, I do a lot of the. So he made, so I have a. So to Marshall, he's the gentleman. He actually has MP scale models, and he does. He's an end scaler, so he oh. does. He does end scale uh, 3D printed detail parts and, and uh, concepts, and so he is. He's a 3D expert, and so I wow. work with him. He prints for me, and then um, uh, I do all the you know the final packaging, uh, product you know, preparation for finishing painting. And then, um, like decals, for example, they come from Circus City Decal, which is uh, sure. by far the, the best custom decal manufacturer in the states. Uh, Matt Welke does an amazing job, um, and we worked with him on these and gave him the exact details. So the solar panels are, you know, custom fit for the specific panel that uh, sure. the customer purchases. So it's it's exact fit every time, and yeah. there's no you know trying to really just trying to remove the variability, making sure that what the customer gets. They're able to maximize their time at the workbench to quickly install that solar panel and get it get their car back on the railroad um, to enjoy it. So, because we know it's nice, people get frustrated if they get a kit they can't complete it because it's made outside of their skill scope. Uh, we don't want it to be the case with macro products. We want to make sure that everyone can uh, enjoy these products and then, of course, then take them back to their layout and enjoy them there as well. Yeah, lovely, lovely. So. Greg, I've uh, got nothing else to to ask. Is there anything else you wanted to bring up? Or no, I, I, no? this is a it's, it's been it's an absolute it's an absolute honor of mine to share uh, my story about the hobby, uh, Mac Rail, Michigan Interstate, yeah. um, and also share you know share the the, the relationship with, our, with my friends and other yeah, modelers. Sure. And so, no, I just want to thank you, Daz, for the the opportunity to come on and. My pleasure. chat with you tonight about this. This has been amazing. 
Yeah, definitely. So I, I think moving forward, I definitely would love, love to have you back on again, maybe just on just the operational side of things, I think would sure. be a, a fascinating and just like a walkthrough with the layout or something like that, I think would be um, quite well received because it's just something of the, the hobby that's really starting to interest me um, moving forward. And I just think there's, I've got so much to learn. Unfortunately, as I said, I model European, but everything's in German and I can't speak German. So I'll do a, a hybrid Australian, American, German, sort of operating scheme moving forward, how to do it. So, um, Greg, I must thank you from the bottom of my heart, taking time away from your family. You've got a young family. Um, obviously, modelling time is at an essence, being a young father, as as what I am as well, and kids running around and running amok, as <laughs> mine are. You probably can't hear them, but um, keep popping their head in, saying, are oh, you finished because I want to play a game or something similar. So I must thank you for coming on the show tonight and I look forward to having you back on in the very near future. Thank you so much, Diaz. I appreciate your time. Make sure you subscribe, click that little bell icon to be notified of upcoming videos. Support us on Patreon, like us on Facebook and Instagram at Model Railroad Technique.